Thanks. Do I need to use the microphones at all for Ritz? Okay, cool. Thank you. Awesome. Well, first, I want to get to know you guys a little bit. So uh, we'll just kind of go in order, just your name, uh, what you were doing before real estate, and what caused you to get into this industry. So who wants to go first? Dave cool. France. I, uh, I came on in December, but I haven't been here very much. Um, but I, I decided that it's time to start. So that's why I'm here. Cool. But, uh, I've been in sales for 20 20 plus years. I was in construction sales for 19 ish of that. So, anything to do with construction projects, orange stuff, signs, that type of stuff, I sold to the same client base for almost 20 years. Wow. So, cool. It's a very small industry, probably like real estate. Yeah. Um, you know, there's not that many people that are good at big highway construction and building bridges and roads mm. so it's a tight community where you have to like you do the same stuff yeah you go around and see your, your people you get your touches you do your tasks in your cmr system it, i mean sales is sales is sales mm -hmm. people buy from who they like and so it just Cool. Well, what caused the transition into so real estate? My ex was in real estate when we first got married, and over we were married for almost twenty years. Over that time, she was in real estate probably about half of it, and like she got into it when we were young, and so we bought our first home when we were twenty-five. Mm. Uh, I'm pretty handy, so I flipped a few houses over those years together with her and I made a lot of money doing that. Yeah. I made on the last home that I just sold last year just because of the market and everything I made three three times my salary. Yeah. Just by selling that home. So it's an exciting industry. You can make money but you do have to work. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Sweet. Great. We'll just kind of sneak around. Yeah. I had my license for about a year and a half, so I'm learning to be with it. So I was working at a place called Living Specialist, uh, just a tax credit for small businesses. But that is coming to an end. So I figured it was time to hop back in here and really try to take off and do good real estate. Sweet. Yeah. You're up, Stephanie. Cool. Awesome. And all that stuff. Kids are all in school, and so now I'm like, what's the next step in life? Give it a whirl. Too much full time, an audiologist. I'll let you talk about that. So I'm an audiologist that's hearing aids, um, hearing tests at the VA. So I'm still going to plan to do that full time, but she's going to do more full time aging. I'll do night seeing things, kind of things. We're still taking our tests. Cool. Uh, so my test is on Friday. So hopefully I'll pass. Are you going to nice. keep working because you like what you do, or are you going to keep working because you want to pay the bills? I do not That's like what I do, but <laughs> so I need to pay the bills, and if real estate, you know, could be an income replacement, yeah, that transition will probably happen. Cool. Yeah, if you can make that work. Okay. Three years. Sweet. Okay. I'm Lucas, and I got my license in September. Um, got into it because my dad has an alcohol company. Sweet. Awesome. So a good range. Some just starting out, some who 
I uh, have been in for a couple months, a little over a year. So we've got uh, a good range today. And we'll, we'll talk about quite a bit of different uh, strategies that can help each of you where you're at in your real estate career. And ultimately just setting a vision for what this can evolve into over time. Um, I think real estate is probably uh, appealing to most people because of the flexibility and freedom time-wise that it can provide at some point, uh, but also the unlocking of you know, financial opportunity. And, uh, and so we'll talk about both of those as well. Um, some of the, let's see. Make sure we can roll the slides today. There we go. So uh, how many of you, this is your first Ignite session? Okay, a few of you, cool. Um, have you two gone through a good chunk of the uh, material? No, okay. I, this is my third class. I, so I started on 18. Okay, last week. okay. I've gone through the entire thing. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. Great. Totally. And that, that's my biggest encouragement. Ignite is meant to be a kind of rocket fuel to starting your career. So something that we do that's a little bit different is uh, give you the opportunity to learn from top producers. Um, this system that Keller Williams has put together, we only allow our top 20% agents to teach this class. And so you're learning from the best in the industry. And the reason why we do that is because learning from your own mistakes is a good way to get into production, but learning from the mistakes of others, hearing other people's stories, especially top producers, actually helps you to fast track that success in the industry. Um, so it is a, a very structured curriculum that Keller Williams puts together, and they update this when we have market shifts and changes. So this is version number six that we're on now. Um, it has 20 classes, and uh, in, in the high, you know, biggest encouragement we can give you is don't treat it like a one and done experience. Like I'm gonna just go through it, I'm gonna know it all, and then I'm ready to go. Um, you wanna have and keep a growth mindset, just realizing that uh, two things happens. Every uh, session, we actually switch up the instructor. So you'll actually get a different perspective, a completely, even though it's the same topic, you'll have different stories come through, a different way of teaching. And so you still have a ton to learn, uh, as Lucas has kind of pointed out, uh, by coming back to these sessions. Uh, this is what I would call the competitive edge when you're starting your career against other agents. Um, you, you probably have heard the stat about 85 to 90 percent of agents quit in the first two years that get their license in the state of Utah. And a big factor for that is not having the proper guidance and support up front. So this is super helpful with that and making sure that you have all the tools at your disposal and then also some really good guidance as you launch your career in the first two years. So we're on this last section, which is planning your future. And uh, this really goes into just setting big vision for uh, what's to come in your career. And uh, oftentimes, welcome, hello. Uh, when people come into this industry, uh, they don't actually fully realize the craziness that can happen as you become a master of real estate. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that journey can look like and some of the agents on this wall, uh, some of their stories. Um, that have achieved some massive success in this industry. So any questions before we get started? How long have you been here? Yeah, I will, I will get into some of that. So I've been um, with KW for the last four years. Uh, I was a real estate investor before that uh, for three years and then also uh, in the door-to-door -door industry for seven years. So door-to-door -door was my kind of launch into sales, um, did that all across the country. Uh, started with security or home automation and then uh, finished with satellite uh, services like DirecTV um, and Dish Network. So did that. Uh, I had a, a great mentor who uh, said, don't come home and blow your money every summer. Instead, buy real estate as, a, as an investment. So my wife and I started buying properties in 2016. We had her get her license in 2017 just to do our own deals. Um, and uh, in that timeline, I had no plan at all of getting actually into real estate on the sell side. Um, and over the course of about four years, we bought five single family properties here in Utah and four in Alabama. And we started to teach our friends and family members how they can build long-term wealth or passive income through owning real estate. And uh, I found people kept saying, why are you not in real estate? Because I was so passionate about the topic and I love real estate. 
uh, to the point where late 2019, I decided, I was like, actually, I do like real estate a lot more than knocking doors. Uh, and my wife didn't want to relocate anymore. We were moving every six months um, to different states. And so uh, we finally said, okay, let's plant roots and, and do something a little bit more long-term. And that's where I got into real estate. Um, and so for the first uh, year, I was still in 2020, I was still in door to door. I still had a large sales team um, that we covered three different states. And so we had about 65 people out there that year. And I traveled between those different offices. And uh, I did 14 units that first year. Uh, and then the second year is when I actually fully went into real estate, cut out door to door. That was 2021. And I did 36 units. Um, and at the same time, became the productivity coach here at KW. And uh, which many of you may have met uh, Angie Fisher or Cameron Wilson. Um, who are absolute rock stars. Uh, Cameron is our current productivity coach, uh, and he has really been influential in building the Red Sign team, which is large, one of the largest teams in the state. Um, and so 2022 is when I stepped into the CEO role here at KW Westfield. And so my day-to-day has shifted a little bit since then. And so my primary focus is consulting, coaching agents, uh, bringing valuable team meetings and trainings to, uh, to each of you so you can grow your business. Um, so I sit with our top people on a consistent basis, uh, every quarter, I'll sit down and do a business consultation with our top 20% and help them to grow their business. Whether they're looking to bring on more support on their team, they're looking to grow their wealth. Um, so that's my current day-to-day. Um, so a little backstory. Yeah. Yeah. Any follow-up questions from that? Before we dive into? Very much. No, I'm still about 10 to 14 units a year. Uh, but my primary, my you know, full focus during the day is coaching agents. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Cool. Well, let's dig in and feel free. This is going to be a, an open uh, kind of dialogue. So if you have questions about, you know, me diving deeper on these concepts, please feel free to ask and we'll, we'll pause as we're going through this. So <clears throat> this is the very simple cycle of the real estate business. Okay. Most people think it's uh, complex. It's actually very simple. It's these three keys and it is lead generation lead follow-up, and then working a transaction from contract to close, okay? And uh, what you want to focus on is being a master of each of these different areas, okay? And on the lead generation side, this is where there's actually so many different ways to lead generate. The first thing that you need to do is get, get very clear about your core four, is what we'll call it, okay? If you have uh, something to write notes on, I'd encourage that. If not, if you can just kind of text yourself or whatever, uh, that works too. But the core four, this is, um, oops, this is something that you want to look at when building a foundation or a solid base for your career is realizing that what most challenges come from is not having clearly identified the methods you're going to use or lean into to create business, okay? So who's read The Millionaire Real Estate Agent so far? of you so i want you to think of it this way if i were to grab a saw and cut off three legs to this chair how many of you would feel comfortable and confident sitting in this chair for the next two hours no one right and yet that's how most people launch their real estate careers. They're leaning on one form of lead generation or one strategy, when in reality, you need to have a well-diversified plan coming into this, okay? So there's 30 to 40 different lead generation tactics or strategies you can use. You just need to get clear about your four. And part of that's gonna be dependent on your personality, your style, what you like. Some people I've had somebody say, I will never, I would rather eat bugs than knock doors. Cool, so don't do that method, right? Um, and so the ones that I highly recommend starting out and go to the MREA the lead generation chapter, and that's where it has a ton of ideas. You can just dive deep and you can say, I'm going to try this one, that one, this one. But the ones that I highly encourage, number one is SOI. Okay. So what, uh, help me out. What does SOI stand for? Sphere of influence and who's accounted for in your sphere of influence? Mm -hmm. Friends and family, and who else? Okay. 
people on your phone? Yep. Yep. Your SOI can be anybody that knows, likes, and trusts you. Okay. So will they recognize your name if you were to message them? So this could even be people on Facebook who you haven't talked to for 10 years. Maybe you went to high school with them or you worked in a different occupation with them and you just lost touch. You don't have their phone number, but if you message them on Facebook, they, they know you. Does that make sense? So they can be counted as your sphere of influence as well. Um, obviously, family, friends is, is a good starting place. Uh, if you grew up in Utah, you should have some uh, foundation of people that you're connected to. So anybody that you have known in the past would be a part of that, even if you don't have all their contact information right now. Okay. And the next one is going to be open houses. Why are open houses a sound lead gen strategy? A lot of buyers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, totally. So you find a little bit more on, on the cycle of people who are, let's call it ready, willing, and able, okay? You have people who are, you do have the looky loos, right? People who are just, it's a Saturday, they're bored, they want to go look at homes. Neighbors uh, as well. Um, but then you have people who are actually highly motivated and some of them don't have representation. They don't actually have an agent yet. So it's actually, uh, you, you're finding them at the peak time in their in the funnel to where they're the quickest to get to a closing okay versus somebody who might be six months or 12 months out from making a, a buy or sell decision right so you actually find the most qualified leads in those settings now with open houses one of the parts that's so important is repetition so it's you cannot expect to do one or two open houses and say oh i didn't get any business from it so it's a dead strategy right the people who really master open houses, they're going to do 50-ish open houses per year. Okay? So they're going to aim for almost one a week. And so uh, if you're going to do that strategy, you want to know that repetition is the key through open houses. Um, what's cool with KW is we have a, you know, kind of a, um, a cool culture of contribution. And so you'll have a lot of our top agents who are super busy who will just say, we have a, a WhatsApp group chat, and they'll just say, I have an open house this Saturday. Would anybody like to take it? And so it doesn't actually have to be your listing. You can just say, I'll go do your open house. And typically, depends on the listing agent, but 85, 90% of them, they just say, any buyers that come through, you get to represent if they're, they don't already have an agent. And then I'll represent the seller, obviously. So we'll both um, work on that transaction together, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, and so uh, and we have a, an actual class on open houses, um, and then we also have a playbook. And the playbook is 30 pages, and it literally says step by step. This is how you prepare and crush it with open houses. This is the email to send. This is the, the uh, door knocking script you can use in advance where you want to go uh, canvas the area, let people know that you're doing an open house, all those things. Uh, but it will also tell you preparation-wise what you should bring, how early beforehand you should set up, all those type of things. Yeah. You're, it, when you're taking that open house, you're owning everything around that open house. Yeah. Great yeah, question. We did one on Saturday, me and Lucas. And it, was a, it was a good experience. Um, I got one lead that didn't have representation, but it was a, very, it was a sunny Saturday. So it was a very busy open house. Um, there was a lot of activity. I did see that most of the people, so the lead that I got said that they were three to six months time frame to buy. Most of the people that were close, closer than that, I would say, had representation at the open house. So, I mean, hmm. yeah, yeah, and that's that's going to be a reality, right? Some of these people who are looking, they already have an agent, yeah, I mean, which is totally fine. There was one couple that came, they were the first couple that came, and they basically told me that they were going to write a home. And uh, I was like, You got an agent? And they're like, Yeah, but he wasn't with us. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. So, but Sweet. it was definitely a good experience. How many people did you guys? I mean, obviously you learn as you go, and you probably get a little bit better at doing stuff because it's the same numbers game that seems to improve in the year. Totally. Yeah. So up front. Yep. Or contacts. Did you say you had one unrepresented buyer? 
Okay. One, that, one that I got, their, their contact information, I followed up with them after the open house. They were open with me and, and basically said, yeah, we're not looking to buy for like three to six months, but we can, we can continue this conversation for the next three to six yeah, months. Yeah. So. so that's more of the reality too, is that there are a lot of agents or a lot of people that will come through that are represented already. Right. And so we can't, we can't support them. And so what you're looking for is the unrepresented clients. And so part of it is just, you have to do, uh, you know, an immense amount to, let's say it's only one, every other open house that you do that you get, well, that's roughly 25 new potential clients that year and high quality, you know, people who are at the top of the funnel. Right. Did you have a my personality fits open houses and door knocking because I'm very personable. I, I like to talk to people. Somebody tells me they have an agent. Oh, doesn't accept me. You know, it's like great. It's like, all right, who is he? Or who are they? Yeah. So so that's my personality. But some people don't have that personality. Some mm -hmm. people are like rather texting. That's not me. I, I don't like texting. I do it. Totally. So these are the other ones that I uh, recommend. Again, you can go deep on all the different marketing and prospecting tactics that are in the MREA. But the ones I really like is building a referral program. So your sphere, people who know, like, and trust you, they also have great relationships with other people, right? And there's something called a transfer of trust that can happen where let's say that you introduce me to a friend, right? Immediately, just because you made the introduction, they're going to have an immense amount of trust for me compared to if I just knocked on their door or cold called them or whatever. Them at an open house. Yes. Right. Because what they do is they're transferring some of your trust that they already have with you over to me. Does that make sense? And so that's where the referral program strategy is. Well, ultimate, if you look at our top agents, most of them have something called a repeat and referral business where most of their business is repeat clients or referrals. Now they still do other lead generation strategies, but probably 50 to 60% of their business every year comes from those two methods. And so up front, you have to be very intentional about what that looks like to generate referrals from your sphere. So it's the type of conversations that you might have. So for example, that actually might be client events, this is gonna look like more strategies, but they're all kind of layered within one another. So for example, a part of your sphere influence process, you would have events as a primary focus. So we do two big events here at the office level. You can do you know, any events at any time, but we organize bigger ones for you twice a year. So we'll do one in June called Keller Splash, and we'll rent out uh, Splash Summit, the water park, and instead of, it's roughly $30,000 for a night. And so instead you guys can say, okay, I'm gonna bring people at six bucks, seven bucks a ticket. And that includes parking, the tube, entrance, everything, right? And so it's far more cost effective to do it that way. And you can also get some lenders or something like that to chip in and help with the cost. But for 50, you know, 50 people, you're looking at 300 bucks roughly. And the cool thing is it's, it doesn't feel salesy. When you call people and you're just like, hey, it's been a while. Want to reconnect, see how life is going. Hey, by the way, we're having this fun event. Uh, it's a little summer bash. Would love for your family to come. Can you guys make it? I'll send you over the details. All right. Now on all the marketing, the email invitation, all that, it's going to still show your real estate brand. So it's going to plant the seed that you're in real estate, but you didn't have to call them and say, hey, are you guys looking to buy, sell, or invest right now? Right. But you could say, hey, do you have any family members that would like to come with you? Right. When you have a client, um, and I won't go too deep on this because we do have a lot to go through, but when you do have a client, what conversation are you having during the listing presentation or buyer consultation that will generate referrals? Okay. One of those ways is creating a promise. So you might say, Lucas, hey, I want to make a promise after the listing presentation. They're like, we're good to go. Let's do it. Right. I want to use you as my agent. I can say, Lucas, I want to make a promise to you guys. My promise is that I'm going to help you guys buy a home in the fastest time possible with the least amount of hassle possible. And we're going to negotiate the best deal we can. Does that sound good? What I'm going to ask for you in return is if you feel like we did a great job and we go over the top, would you please recommend us to two or three people? Because what's going to happen, Lucas, I can promise you this, is you're going to run into family members or friends when you tell them that you're moving. They're going to say, me too. 
It's just normal. So if you run into somebody like that, will you make sure to, to direct them towards me so I can help them through that process? Is that, is that fair? Okay. So you can make that promise and you're just planting the seed again, because what's going to happen, you guys always, always have that happen when you say, hey, we're going on a trip or we're doing this. You tend to find other people who are doing something similar. And so when people are selling their home or buying a new home, you'll ha they'll commonly have friends that raise their hand or family members and say, we're looking at making a move too. And so you want them to think of you in that situation. Okay. So um, any questions on the core four? So the focus is just build your core four. And here's the second piece of that is become an expert on that, on each of those areas. So you've got to study them, be a student of those areas first, and then commit to mastery, which is just through sheer repetition. Okay. So any of these that you do, it's going to be through repetition. Uh, SOI, I will hit on this just because it is the, probably the most important thing to get into business as quick as possible. How many of you are familiar with the Ford conversation framework? Okay, cool. And I'll go through that just because of the, uh, less than half the class. So this is the easiest way to have conversations without it feeling like a sales call. And Ford stands for family occupation, recreation, and dream. Okay. So it's a simple framework that you can utilize with having conversations. I'll share one of my first transactions. Actually, my first transaction um, was a, I reached out to somebody on Facebook. I haven't talked to for a long time. Um, we were acquainted in high school, but we weren't really friends. We we're just, we had similar friends groups. And so I was messaging a bunch of people every day on Facebook when I first got started and just said, hey, it's been forever, would love to reconnect. Looks like you've, been, you've had a lot going on in life. Um, let's jump on a call sometime. Simple, nothing about real estate, nothing of what I do for business. And you'll have 70% of people just not respond. Totally fine. You have 30% of people who say, yeah, let's do it. And they'll just send their phone number. Great. So Scott was this individual and I called Scott. He's like, Scott, man, I saw you pop up on my Facebook feed. I saw that you have kids now. Life's changed, obviously, since you know, the last decade. So just tell me what, where you've been. What have you guys been doing the last three, four, five years? And he just went into a story, right, about what his family is doing and things like that. And, um, and so I asked about his family. It looks like you have two kids. It's awesome. Uh, you know, how'd you meet your wife? Those things, just kind of catching up. And then the occupation side is where he changed the subject. So I said, well, that's awesome, man. Well, what are you doing for work now? And he's like, oh, I'm in tech. And he goes on, I'm like, oh, what kind of tech? What do you do? And he's like, I work at you know, Lehigh. And goes through, just tells us a little bit about his story. And then guess what question he asks me? Yep. And that's natural. It's just normal for them to kind of exit that conversation by saying, well, what do you do? Right? So that's the perfect time for you to plant the seed of, I'm in real estate now. Because they open the can of worms, not you. So they don't feel like you called for that because they're the ones that ask the question. Does that make sense? And so it's a great strategy to have that conversation. So I'm, I'm in real estate. I'm loving it. I, you know, for me in that conversation, it's like I've been rent, buying rental properties for the past three, four years. And it's been fun. He's like, oh, I'm looking for a rental property right now. And within 30 days, we had him under contract on a deal. And I hadn't talked to him for almost 10 years. So, and to finish this conversation, I didn't say like, oh, great. Well, let's have that conversation right now. I said, oh, that's awesome, man. Well, let's definitely set up a conversation. I'm, I'd love to see if I can help you in some way. What do you guys like doing for fun? I just completely changed the subject. Because again, I want him to feel like I don't need the business and that I'm not just calling him for business. I'm actually calling to build a relationship, right? So recreation is what fun plans do you guys have for the summer? Do you have any travels? Do you have anything going on? Or what do you do for fun? What are your hobbies? Um, you guys traveling for Christmas? So you can ask a bunch of different questions on the re recreation side are, are pretty easy. Dreams, what, what big goals are you chasing this year? You know, one of the things that's important to me, Scott, is that I love helping uh, my friends and family members, you know, uh, uh, attack their goals. So I'm just curious, are you training for anything right now or any specific targets that are on the books for you this year? Because I want to use that as well, right? So if I can truly give them a resource or be a support in, in cheering them on, on a goal, maybe they're running a marathon or they're doing something pretty big this year, I want to be able to check in and say, hey, how's the marathon training going? Or, hey, I just saw this podcast that, tied to this goal that you have, um, and it made me think of you. So it's non-real estate related throughout the year that I can make more touches if I know that information. Does that make sense? And any key things that they share, yeah, our family's going to Disneyland in May. Oh, sweet, that's awesome. That's gonna be a fun trip. 
Now I can, when I call them in July, I can say, hey, how was the family vacation to Disneyland in May? Right, so I can bring that information up. So you wanna make sure that you're documenting all those important little pieces that they share with you on those calls. Okay. Does Ford make sense? Okay, cool. So that's a great framework. Um, yeah, family, you got it. Nope, let's hear it. Family, there's occupation, recreation. Yep, there we go. Awesome. Lead follow-up, uh, we're not gonna dive too much into command, but I will mention it multiple times. That's a CRM, that's our database platform or system, uh, the best technology to be able to run your business in real estate. And so that has what's called touch plans or smart plans in there, where, for example, if you put somebody's birthday in there and then you put the birthday smart plan on their, their profile, every single year it will send them a text message saying happy birthday. And it's called dynamic messages. So um, when you do the birthday one, for example, there's five different things it can say. So the messages are very different. That way, every year, it's not the exact same birthday text that they get. It will switch it up and say, okay, we're going to choose a different message this year. So that way they can't tell that it's just a program message, which the is next cool. next year you're going to have AI writing those messages, right? It's already in there. Oh. Yep. It's, they've already built, built uh, connected chat GPT in there. And so you can use that as a tool, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was at your thing last week about your seminar. Oh, yeah. Tomorrow, because I want to hear the rest. Yes. You guys can come tomorrow. Yeah. If you're able to come tomorrow at 11, uh, we're going to talk about some pretty cool stuff. So. Um, and then the transaction process is also in command. So basically, throughout the, the t t in order to generate more business, you want to provide the best quality experience for any sphere of influence or people that are in your pipeline, right? So servicing the business is such a key because that's actually what generates referrals in the back end. If you go above and beyond, if you just do what's expected, right? If you're like, oh, that's what an agent should have done. They should have shown me homes. You're not going to get referrals because <laughs> they're like, I expected that. Like he, he got paid for it or she got paid for that. But if you go above and beyond and do things that are unique and different than what they expected, that's where they say, I've, we've got to tell everybody about this, right? Yeah, all the things that, Play was talking about that he does in his one with sellers last week. Yeah, was I think the reason that he was successful is he was totally. He has answers to all of his questions. He knows his stuff. He goes above and beyond with probably every client that he interacts with. Yeah. And, yep. Uh, sorry to interrupt. No, you're good. It's kind of the idea. Like, how many of you have referred your friends to go eat at McDonald's in the last ten years? Why? It's, it's cost effective. They're fast. Why have you not recommended them to somebody? They already know about it. But it's nothing new or exciting. It's nothing new or exciting, and it's just like we got what we paid for, right? Speed and cheapness, essentially. But if you think of maybe your favorite restaurant, right, where they probably have some really high quality service or the food is just amazing, it goes and, and beats your expectations, you're probably referring that to people. Right. So think of how can you build your, your real estate business in the same way where you go uh, above and beyond. And so when it comes to command, it actually helps you with that because you can document your systems in command. So every single buyer that you put into your pipeline, they get the same experience from you. So if you're like, hey, after we go under contract, I always have crumble cookies delivered to their home. You can put a link for the crumble cookies website on on here and they'll say, hey, the buyer just went under contract, order crumble cookies. we will remind you on that step. Because if you just try to do it from memory, everybody's going to get a very inconsistent experience from you, right? Because there's 70 ish items that have to be done to get somebody to the finish line. You're not going to remember all that. So that's where we already have a template in there of saying this is what you should do when a buyer's under contract or a seller's under contract. But you can go expand on that list and build your own personalized experience for each client, which is cool. Okay, so we're going to talk about setting your sights on big uh, picture and big future. We're then going to dive into uh, some specific goal setting tactics and strategies that you can deploy and ultimately how you can get into business as quick as possible and build a very solid pipeline. So uh, this is a great quote from the MREA. It says, how you think matters. How you think in the beginning really matters. Okay. So starting out, you can be either the uh, biggest proponent of your success or the biggest blocker of it. 
And so how you think about your business, how you think about yourself, actually is going to create a lot of the results that you're going to see. And so part of this, um, you have to ask the question of where do our beliefs typically come from? Family, parents, history, friends groups, social media, whatever Netflix series we're watching right now, right? News. There's so many different places that we're influenced. And so what you have to do is constantly say, is this actually my thought or is this something that somebody else has given to me, right? And early on, I'll just label one of the ones that's most commonly uh, found in the real estate space is just the imposter syndrome, right? So for example, when you are going to a listing presentation or buyer presentation, the back of your mind, it's very easy to ask, well, why would they want to use me? I haven't sold the real estate. I haven't sold the deal yet, or I've only done two homes. Okay, it's very easy to have that belief system. And you have to think like a top producer from day one. Start telling yourself that you are a top producer. Every single person on this role, on this wall, just for clarity, this is called the masters of real estate. So everybody in the last 12 months, we, we update this every single month, um, everybody who has earned over six figures in this office. And what I'll tell you is that every single one of them had to sell their first home at some point. Doesn't matter. Some of them have been in the business for 25 years. Okay. They all sold their first home. But if you can just say, I'm going to figure it out, I'm going to make it happen and have that belief system, it's going to change the energy of what your clients feel. If you go into it and say, hey, yeah, I will do my best to sell your home, right? Even though I said something, they may not feel the same. Feel, they're going to feel my energy and, and feel like, oh, there's a little bit of lack of confidence. They're not going to say that out loud. That's why they're going to say, oh, great. Let us think about it. We're going to interview a couple agents, right? Whereas uh, starting out, one of the things I would lean on is the success of our brokerage. So what I would do in my listing presentations and buyer consultations up front is I would say our office sold $1.2 billion in real estate last year. Uh, we have over 300 agents in our office and an immense team to support you guys in getting your home sold quickly. So I promise that we're going to be able to support you at a high level. Is that a little bit different? No, I hadn't sold a home at that point, <laughs> but I didn't act like that, right? I just told them the success of the real estate office. So this year, I think we, we sold uh, just under a billion dollars last year in volume. So similar stat, but you know, we, we are, for a market share perspective, we're almost double the next agent or next brokerage in, in production. So that's what I leaned on up front is the success of the brokerage. And then over time, I was able to translate that into my own personal success, okay? Mindset matters. So the question of what is your mindset? Are you aligned with your heart? And are you ready to take action to have a successful day? So I'm curious, what are some of the thoughts or beliefs that you guys feel like you've had coming into this industry? Um, if there's been any kind of fear of, well, can I make it happen? Is there a fear of failure? What are some of the thoughts, either your own or just things that you might think other people uh, starting in their real estate career might think about? So I've done this for a long time, but I like, I'm a big adversary of planning. I think that if you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, right? But uh, like what I, whenever, I've been in sales a long time. And so when I would get like a big account or a big project, I would, I would start my day with like thinking through how I wanted things to go. Yeah. Like, okay, so this is, this is, I've got to call so and so. I've got to email so and so, and, and this is what I want to accomplish. And this is this is like how I want to come across, and and just being like mindful about all those different things, it really helps to. Not everything is going to go through smooth and, and exactly how you expected it, but you're going to be able to maybe like pivot or 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 just to just to get it to go better overall, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big thing, especially when I'd have like a big, like in this industry, it would be a big closing. I would get up that morning and I would say, okay, this is this is how I want the closing to go. This is when we're going to be there. This is 
you know, and I, I just try and try my best to, to plan it all out so that even if it didn't go 100% how my plan went, it would still go 80%. And so I would have, I would feel like I would be more in control than if I just showed up and said, okay, I'm here. What are we doing? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Planning is such a, a, a vital uh, foundation and it's the, there's a quote it says something to this extent of leaders react in, excuse me, leaders anticipate losers react. Right. And so if you actually start thinking in your business of like, I'm going to plan for the best and prepare for the worst at the same time, right? Have a backup plan in place. Like that is the ultimate position to put yourself in is just saying, hey, it's cool if things don't go exactly as planned. I'm going to pivot. Yeah, that's a very good mindset to have. Other than the opposite of that uh, is what I would call the victim mentality. Right, like, oh crap, that bill fell through. Why'd that happen to me? Right? That other agent's fault. No, <laughs> you know. Or this is how it's always gonna be. Bills are always gonna fall through. Right? You can see how we also have a lot of those belief systems just in society in general today, right? And so just start thinking through the lens of which mindsets do I want to have um, to see this industry through, because that's gonna impact the type of business that comes to you as well. Okay. Any others? One that I'll, I'll mention is interesting. Uh, Keller Williams has a very different um, value proposition culture, if you will. Uh, on our board upstairs at the top uh, on the wall, it says God, family, then business. That's, that's our values uh, in, in, in that order. And ultimately, we believe that you don't actually have to be just focused on the money. You can actually just focus on building great relationships, like just being a good person. The money will be a natural byproduct of that, right? So it's a kind of the old way versus a new way of selling real estate. And it's actually far more enjoyable because ultimately at the end of the day, if you're going to be in this industry for five years, 10 years, 20 years, what you should want to come out with is just awesome relationships because you're not going to remember, oh, this is how many doors I sold in 2013. Like that's not going to be your story when you're 80, year old, 80 years old on your rocking chair, right? So uh, part of that is just aligning with your heart, making sure that you are in this for the right reasons because okay, that's also going to be a big driving force. Um, and then really you have to ask yourself and you have to have a consistent routine of getting into uh, the, the proper mindset just for every day, right? To take the best course of action. So KDB's belief system, uh, this is called the Y4C2Ts. And this is uh, something that is really the driving force behind why we do what we do and how we do business, okay? So this is defined, you should either create your own belief system or just adopt this one if you do resonate with these items. So first off, win, win, or no deal. You'll see in some uh, industries, especially in sales, you'll see people will do whatever they need at whatever costs, right? Even if it's at the sacrifice of somebody else. And so we believe in the opposite where it's win, win, or no deal. Like we're gonna find a win for the sellers or the buyers on the other side, and it's gonna be a win for us, but we're just not gonna move forward with this. Okay. And there is a win-win that can happen if it's meant to be. Okay. Uh, integrity, doing the right thing, especially in this industry, it's very easy to, to kind of ride the gray area. And reality, you just have to say, is this the right thing to do in this moment? Okay. So make sure that integrity is a part of your driving force. Uh, customers always come first, commitment in all things, communication, seek first to understand, creativity, ideas before results. Teamwork together, together, everyone achieves more. And that's something you'll realize very quickly here at KW. That's where you get to do other people's open houses. That's where you'll have top agents come and teach this class. They don't get paid for that. It's just that they believe we are all working on this together. Like you're going to have a listing where I'm going to have a buyer and we might want to make an offer. And if we've worked together well through classes and things like that, we're probably going to do a deal together, right? So it's all going to come full circle the way it needs to. And so you'll have top producers, you'll have some of these agents who are making $500,000, $800,000 a year telling you all their secrets. Whereas in some communities, it's like, I'm not sharing my best practices. Like that's going to, you know, lower my ability to sell, which is not the reality. It's, there's actually an abundance of opportunities out there. And our agents don't believe that if I give you my best strategies, it's going to take food off my table. It's just not how it works. We believe that it's actually going to probably amplify what we're able to achieve together. Trust, 
starts with honesty, equity, opportunities for all, and success results through people. Um, and that's another big one is realizing that at some point, um, you're going to realize that you should not take the approach of I'm going to do it all. That's probably one of the biggest mistakes as an entrepreneur is saying that like nobody else can do it better than me. So I'm going to just take every single task uh, in this industry and do it myself. Um, one example of that is using a transaction coordinator. Okay. How many are familiar with Jeanette or, or with the TC? Okay. So that is one of those ones early on where agents are like, I'm going to do all the paperwork. Yeah, if you ask most of these top, there's probably 5% of these top producers that do their paperwork. So that was the action. Now, you want to understand it. I'm not saying that, yeah. okay? Gary Keller says uh, this great perspective. He says, you can delegate the work, but you cannot delegate the understanding of it, okay? So in this realm, what happens is our TC, she'll write the offer for you based on the terms that you gave her. Then it will go to your email for you to, to review and then you'll hit confirm before it goes to the client, right? So you're still double checking, making sure it's done properly. But instead of through the transaction and same thing with the addendums, instead of it taking, you know, let's say four hours back and forth of all the addendum writings and offer writing, it might only take you 30 minutes, okay? So now you can use that time to connect with clients and do things that are more important, that are higher income producing activities. Does that make sense? Okay. I've always found if you're not dealing with paperwork every day or at least, on a consistent basis, it's better to have somebody that is doing it on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where Jeanette, we have, so instead of you going and having to hire somebody full time, um, we know most people starting out don't have excess funds to be able to do that. So we just have somebody fully on staff just for that role. And so you're just paying per service when the deal closes. So you're not paying up front, you're paying after the transaction closes. And that makes it easy. And it's $350 per file or $425 if you're doing marketing and things like that um, with the transaction. But that allows you to, and if you actually break it down, it ends up being like 15 bucks an hour. Way better for you to go do $50 an hour tasks, right? Lead generation, servicing clients, things like that, rather than doing the paperwork side. So your value proposition, this is, um, we actually help you to define this in a previous course. But this is just a reminder that you want to ask yourself, does my value proposition truly reflect who I am, the value I bring, and the benefit my clients will experience working with me? Okay. Um, most people don't get clear about their value proposition, and that comes, it's very clear for your clients to fill that in a listing appointment or, or buyer consultation. Because they'll feel kind of confused, right? Because if an agent, their value proposition is, I can show you homes, I can negotiate for you and I can get you to the finish line. Okay. Well, so can 20 other 20,000 other agents in the state of Utah. So what's the difference? So a value proposition is simply what is your unique approach to servicing a client that's going to enhance their overall experience. Okay. And this second question is Am I confident sharing my value proposition with my contacts? If not, how can I make it easier to express my value? So this actually comes through when you're calling your sphere of influence. You should contact everybody at least four times a year, once every quarter. And we'll have these, uh, what's very common is for people to be very hesitant around making those phone calls. And that stems from not having clarity around what the value is that we're delivering. Um, think of it this way. Um, who in here banks at Chase Bank? None of you? Okay. All right. Well, Lucas, let's just, I'm going to use you for example. If I were to tell you, we go, we've got another hour left in this class. Will you drive down to Chase Bank and ask them for $10,000 and just bring that to us? If you do that, I'll give you 50000 How confident are you that they're going to give you ten grand in the next hour? Who else feels that they're going to make that happen? <laughs> Try, right? What are they going to say? Uh, you don't have that relationship. <laughs> yep. You haven't made that deposit. You haven't made enough deposits, and you don't have a relationship with us, essentially, right? So same thing happens with your database, with your sphere. When you're calling them, just asking for something, can I make a withdrawal? They're saying, hey, you haven't talked to me for three years. <laughs> Why are you trying to make a withdrawal and you haven't made any deposits? It's the same perspective, right? 
So the ultimate goal starting out is making deposits through providing value. And so all you've got to say is I'm going to make a $100 deposit here. I'm going to make a $300 deposit here. I'm going to make a $500 deposit here through these different touch points throughout the year, knowing that in six months or three years, I'm going to be able to make a withdrawal. Does that make sense? So it's actually easier if you define your value up front. And there's two areas of this, the, the value of who I am and how I'm servicing them. But then also what resources am I actually providing? That's a different layer of value. So usually when you're making your calls, you want to come with an item of value to the table. So for example, uh, providing them with your app that allows them to search for homes all across the country. It's tied into all MOSs. And uh, so if you're, if you, for example, if I were at an open house and I ran into a buyer and they're not represented, I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to actually send you guys my app. What it does is pulls all the listings on the market. I know you probably use the MLS app right now. This one's so, so much more robust and has some new features that you're going to love. And I would open it up really quick and just demo it for them. One of the cool features that I love is it shows you actually program your top three visited places. So you might put your gym, you might put your work, you might put grandma's house on here. Now, every single house that you click on moving forward, when you click on that house, the first thing it's going to show you is drive time to all three of those locations. How convenient is that, right? So you know at any moment how long it's going to take you to get to your three favorite places. Is that a value proposition? Yeah, right? So you want to come up with what are all the 25 different value propositions I can offer based off of a client situation. I'm not going to do that to an investor. I've got to have a different value proposition. I'm not going to do that to, to a seller unless they're trying to buy as well. Does that make sense? So you want to say, okay, for a seller, this is my value proposition. For a buyer, this is my value proposition. For a, uh, uh, an investor, this is my value proposition. And what are the five to seven things I can offer when I'm on a phone call with an investor or with a seller? that could be of value to them. Cool. And then how you present it, right? So that's something you want to practice as well as just your delivery around it, okay? Um, if you, there's a, when I was in door to door, I had a great mentor who taught me a principle. He said, don't practice on money. What does he mean by that? Yes. Like we would go out and agents would, or door-to-door -door reps would go knock and that's where they'd get their practice in. They would do no role playing. They'd do no script practice. They'd just go practice on people when it actually counted. And so they'd lose out on people who would buy, but they just did a crappy presentation, right? They didn't deliver it very well. And so one of my highest encouragements is to find some, uh, some um, script practice partners where you can role play together. So that way, when you deliver your buyer presentation or your listing presentation or just your sphere of influence call, you're going to realize when you're talking to somebody, when it doesn't count, like, oh, man, that, that kind of sucked in it. Like, I could have fixed this part and this part. And they can give you feedback as well. So that way, when you do get on a call with a potential client, when it does count, you're more polished, right? Still not going to be perfect, but get your practice in and repetitions in in a script practice environment where it supports that practice. Does that make sense? Cool. Any question on value propositions? Yeah. So um, Gary Keller has uh, a, an interesting diagram. That looks like this. And and what he um, what he does is is establishes how important it is to define your why. Like why are you doing what you're doing? And oftentimes when you ask that question, what might somebody say on why they're trying to earn $100,000? Pay their bills. Pay their bills, right? <laughs> that might be a reason. Is it a valid reason? Yes, right? Is it gonna be the highest and best use of reasons? Probably not, right? Because 
it's not the biggest driver. It's something that we know we have to have done, but usually what happens is once we meet that need, we let off the what? Let off the gas, right? I've paid the bills. So what we have to do is actually layer, build layers of reasons. We have to have multiple reasons or driving forces that cause us to do what we do, okay? So what you wanna do is ask yourself that question multiple times and write in, well, this is also important. I wanna have um, you know, a vacation with our family every year. And we don't have to worry about the budget for that vacation, right? Or I want to put aside a certain amount for our retirement. It's another reason, right? Or I want to invest and build wealth. It's another reason, right? So you can start putting all these reasons on why. And for Gary, his at the very top, he says his ultimate reason is to be the best version of himself that he can be. And so part of this is defining like, what does a big life look like? So with this, what this means going in a little bit more depth, is when you are on your rocking chair, 80 years old, and you're looking back at life, what are you saying your life was about? Are you actually telling your grandkids, this is how many homes I sold back in 1972, right? Nobody cares about that. So what do you wanna actually be defined by? Well, you probably had to get clear about your reasons first in order to get at that final destination that you wanna be in, right? And so to be the best version of you, you have to get clear about, well, what does that actually look like? What do I want things, uh, who do I want people to say that I was when I pass on? And so define what your big life is. And that actually brings more clarity around your, your vision, your ultimate vision of, well, in order for me to get there, this is who I'd have to become. So these are the types of things that I would do for the big achievements that I would chase this year and in, in, in future years. So one thing all high achievers have in common is they are working for a big why. The big why is about having a purpose, a mission, or a need that in turn gives you focus. So this is, a, again, one of those encouragements is you have to get clear about what is important to you because when you, let's say you are knocking doors or you are making phone calls to sphere of influence or whatever lead generation method you're using, after about 20 repetitions, it gets pretty boring. Or after 50 no's, you're like, ah, is this gonna work? All right? Is it gonna eventually turn into success? The only uh, driver that's gonna help you to keep get going past all those no's or the rejection is gonna be having a big enough why, okay? If I said, I will pay anybody 50 bucks to go door knock for the rest of the day, and tried to take a listing or get a buyer, how many of you would take that challenge? One, okay. What if I said $50,000? All you have to do is stick it out for eight hours. Everybody? Okay. The reason's bigger, right? So you've got to find that threshold for you. What is the number or what's the reason that's compelling enough to do the work that you just don't want to do, right? That you're not going to do for 50 bucks, but you'll do it for 50,000. Does that make sense? So big, because you are after extraordinary results and why, it is the reason you get up every day and do what you do. So uh, very often in society, you know, people are told to play small or to not try to go and earn as much money as they can because it might be looked at as greedy, right? Or don't go and work 45, 60 hours a week, right? And the reality is that you've got to define what a big life looks like to you and not adopt that from somebody else, okay? Um, this goes back to that initial thought of belief systems, right? And so do you believe that you wanna have the best for you or your family that you could, and why not go chase that? So you've gotta define what that is, and then also um, why it's important to you. So why do you wanna have uh, a certain level of retirement income, right? Why do you wanna have the new car or the new house? Why do you want to have your kids college fund fully funded before they go to college? Like, why are those things actually meaningful to you? So your big why powers your big life. I'm gonna pause on that section. What are some top takeaways from the past 30, 40 minutes? What are some things that have stood out to you? Like 
Mm. Yeah, so true. Cool. Perfect. Um, I'm really square one here. So, but if you're talking about you know how you're offering to teach these different things to professionals by yourself. Yes. What if you said five to seven things that you could offer? Yeah. My mind is going. <laughs> what will you give? But what are your five to seven things? That you, that you would actually. What would you say to a buyer? What would you say to a seller? What would you say to an investor? To yourself. That yeah. You feel like you're free. You know what I mean? Hold on. Great. Give me an example. Yes. So I'll go through maybe just one for each category. Um, and that's what we actually have some classes on this as well. We have something called MOFRs. Uh, how many are you, of you are familiar with MOFRs? Okay, just one. So MOFRs stand for make offers for immediate response. M-O-F-I-R. So it's a marketing strategy. So a lot of agents might market. You go, does anybody have friends on Facebook that are real estate agents? Okay. What are common things they'll post on social media? On Statistics. <laughs> they kind of mix it between family and, I don't know, I feel like they're marketing themselves and then they put in a great post or, oh, did you know yeah. about this? Or they're doing this is thing about this is great thing, whatever. Yeah. Just little things. But it kind of brands it all together as this is our friend. Totally. This is Mark. This is who he is. Yep. So it's like a good Yeah. When you see real estate stuff, what do you normally see them post about real estate wise? Mark statistics is one of those. Yeah? Yep. I see I see them promoting their next homes. Uh huh. It's like oh you know, you can scan all these square footages and find out. Cool. Okay. Awesome. What what I'll say is pay attention the next like 30 to 90 days of what you see them posting about, okay? Because you'll get a good mix of that. What I'd say is that's probably about like 25% of the posts. The other 75% usually is like just listed or just sold or here's an open house, right? The challenge with that is, or just closed as well, right? I just sold this house. And although that does build uh, and reinforces that you might be a top producer, right? The challenge is it doesn't actually solve a problem for anybody. Like if you sold, if you sold your friend's house, how does that actually help me? It doesn't, right? Whereas the other ones are what we call mofers. So you're actually making an offer for somebody to take action on something that solves a problem for them. So for example, with some of the ones that were mentioned, if we just post the statistics, that's one thing. But if we post the statistics and say, if you'd like a monthly update that I send right to your inbox, to help you understand what's happening in the state of Utah around real estate, but also other economic factors, DM me and I'll send you over my newsletter or DM me and I'll put you on my list, whatever it is, right? So you're actually making an offer where they can now take action, okay? Or for an investor, hey, I've got this flip. If anybody's looking at investing in some deals this year, reach out, right? So you're making an offer for somebody who said, I need to build wealth or whatever their goal is, right? So here's some examples. Um, for my investors, things that I offer, um, I do a, a detailed, I'll pull it up for you to show you. So when I find out, and I, I purposely, I, I work with a lot of investors, it's kind of the niche that I focus on just because I am an investor myself. So I, I speak the language and I like it. So one of the things I'll do is I'll turn it, I'll try to turn everybody into investors, even if they're not yet. And I'll just ask a simple question of, have you ever thought about investing in real estate? Yeah. Most people will say, yeah, in some form or fashion, right? If I say, Lucas, are you trying to buy a home this year? Actually, you'll get a lot of people say no. <laughs> right? If they're just, if they're, maybe they just bought a home last month. Why would they go buy another home, right? And so here's the statistic from the NAR is that six to 8% of your database will buy or sell in any given year, six to 8%. So that means if you call 100 people, only six to eight need to make a move. And you have to find them at the right time and you have to compete against the other agents to get those. Does that make sense? 
Whereas what if 90% of your database says, yeah, I've thought about real estate investing. I just don't know how, or I don't have enough money to get started, right? They have that myth. Well, you now have 90% of your database, 90 out of 100 people that can do business. You just have to teach them the strategies on how. Does that make sense? So that, that was just my approach early on of, of finding more clients. And I found that they were repeat buyers. I had one client buy five homes in the three month time span. I couldn't get a normal first time home buyer to do that, <laughs> right? So uh, one of the things I just offer is a simple calculator or spreadsheet that helps them to analyze deals. Um, and then also kind of calculates their ROI on their, their portfolio. Um, so that was a very simple one of like, oh, cool. It's awesome that you're wanting to start investing. Well, I actually started with seminars, um, which I put on here, I didn't really touch on, but I would highly encourage that of doing buyer, seller, or investor seminars. And you might only have 10 people show up. Um, once I started doing them more consistently, which I do about every quarter, I would get 25, 30 people coming. And we would just do it here in the office where I do it on Zoom. Um, and I would just walk people through what it looks like to start investing and doing it with low or no money, right? Um, for example, I'd coach people, if they already have a house, why not either keep that home, turn it into a rental and move into another house 5% down or 3% down or take equity out of that house if they're like, I'm not moving, we love this house. Great, let's work on a HELOC and maybe take equity out of that home and get into your first investment property. So there's multiple different routes that we can take coaching them through that, right? Um, for sellers, sellers is very simple. Like I would do a, a monthly CMA, so comparable market analysis. Now, um, how many of you have done a CMA so far? Okay. How long does it take? If you're doing a thorough one, how long does it really take? Yeah, you're probably 20, maybe 30 minutes, right? So if you're going to do that for 200 people, how long is that going to take you every month at 20 minutes a pop? Is that 4,000 minutes? Divide that by 60. 66 hours. How many of you have another 66 hours to spare? Nobody's going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why agents don't do it. It's just not realistic. But with tools, you can do it. So I have probably uh, maybe 250, 300 people at this point. Everybody gets a CMA for me every single month. No time. It took me five minutes up front to set it up, but Command has that feature built in. It's a soft CMA, so it doesn't give them the value of their home. And I want that to happen. Why? Because then they have to contact you. Yes. So then they have to reach out if they actually want the true value, but at least it will show them general, like, hey, your neighbor just listens to their house across the street. And they can in their mind be like, oh, we have the same floor plan. And they just sold for 900, we bought this for 600, so we're somewhere in the same ballpark. We have a lot of money in equity, right? So I want them getting that reminder every single month. So that's one of those value propositions for sellers, is I'm gonna help them know the value of their home on a consistent basis, right? Um, for buyers. The app is one of the consistent ones that I lean on into, but the second one is just going to be how do they actually turn it into an investment plan? So the calculator is one thing, but separate from that is actually building an investment plan for them. And so um, basically a wealth consultation. So for buyers, I typically call myself the real estate wealth consultant, not a realtor, <laughs> right? And I say, and I, and I show this very clearly. I say, hey, the normal real estate agent is going to be great at helping you find homes, negotiate, get you guys to the finish line. They're going to help you buy property. What I do different, right? So value proposition is saying, what I, what I do different is I am looked at as a real estate wealth consultant. And so what I help clients do is create a long-term plan to build passive income through buying real estate. And so it might start with buying your first home, but we can then leverage that and turn it into five to 10 properties over the next decade. And if you guys are cool with it, I'd love to sit down and go through that one-on-one -on -one and just show you what that would look like and how that can really set up a, a very strong financial future for you. Okay. So all those make sense. Any questions on those three different value props? Do it right, they just keep coming back. Yes. Well, yes. And there's, there's, I think like when you're starting, you got to identify what do you, do you want to focus on buyers and sellers? Do you want just buyers versus sellers, and then also what kind of buyers and sellers. 
because there's all types of people and people buy from who they like. And so that's that's why your sphere of influence is so important. But identify like like you've been a stay at home mom for how long? So that's that's gonna be a demographic that you're gonna be able to relate with very well, right? And and you being in that position, like if you were a single single mom, um, would you feel intimidated to come into a real estate office? That's a value you could offer that client is, hey, I was a stay-at-home mom for X amount of years. And, and so you can kind of cater to that kind of client. Mm -hmm. Yes. Find your niche. I mean, that's, that's where you're going to make money is finding a niche. Yeah. It's a well, it's, and it has to be something that you personally relate to so that when you're conveying it to a client that it doesn't come across as fake. You know, when we were in that class with Clay the other day, he was talking about scripts. And, you know, the, the little murmur through the room is like, oh, I hate scripts. They always sound so fake. Except when you do it, Clay. And it's like, <laughs> and then what Clay said was, I don't think of scripts as scripts. I think of scripts as answers because that's what they yes. are. They're answers to hard questions. And so if you flip that way that you think about it, you say, okay, I don't want to give this script because they're always coming across as fake and they're always so cheesy and, but not when Clay says it because he's practiced it because he's done it because he's been in the room with agents. And then he's also been in the room with clients saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. And so it becomes second nature. And it's just like, that, that's like me with highway stuff. I could sit in a room with any highway guy in the world and I wouldn't feel intimidated because I know just as much as he does. Real estate's a little different because I don't want to catch a fish out of water. But... I highlight this idea. Let's, let's think of this. If I, um, we maybe just ran into each other at the mall or something, right? It's old friend. And you talk about, you go through the Ford script while you're there, right? Family occupation, recreation dream. What are you doing for work? And, and then you ask me in return. Okay, go ahead and ask me. What do you do for work? I'm in real estate. Oh, cool. Actually, let's reverse that. You you be the agent for a second, okay? okay? So, what do you do for work? I'm in real estate. Oh, really? How's the market? Uh, it's going. It's changed a lot. If you want to learn more about it, I can let you know. Yeah. At a different time, but cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for coming. Awesome. I'm gonna go through a few of you. H how's the market? This <laughs> is like the most intimidating thing. <laughs> It's going. It's going great. <laughs> uh, Which way is it going? <laughs> yeah. How's the market? Okay. How's the market? Awesome. Okay. Now I'm putting you all on the spot on purpose. So there's here's here's one of the invitations that I'll make. Okay. Is just remember this moment on how you feel when you're asked that question, because you're gonna get that question very, very often. And you can go with the off the cuff, right, way of approaching it, which it's a script. You guys all just gave me a script, but that's what you had at the moment. <laughs> yeah. And 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 so let's just reverse it. And I'm not going to say um, what you'll find is that you can upgrade your conversations over time, right? So just as you're aware of these things, you'll start. Oh, there's actually probably a better way to do this. Okay. So who wants me to ask me the question? How's the market? Well, it depends. Are you looking to buy, sell, or invest? All of those are a little bit different. That's, that's a good answer. <laughs> now, here's what it's actually doing, though, is it's buying me time as well to just pause because they put me on the spot. I want to put them on the spot. But also, they're going to give me some insight because they're going to say, well, we've thought about potentially listing our home or we've thought about potentially buying a new house or we've thought about investing because actually all of those markets are a little bit different. Does that make sense? But it also gives me a time to just kind of pause, get my grounding before I 
provide an answer because they're going to go through whatever they're going to respond to, right? And it might lead to some more follow-up questions for me. Oh, great. How long have you guys think, thought about relocating? Why is that important to you right now? Well, we just changed jobs and now we're commuting and commuting 45 minutes. I found communicate, you know, commuting 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes in the evening actually cuts out a lot of family time. Totally get it. Totally understand. Yeah, when it comes to buyer's market, it's interesting. Then I would go into that specific area. Does that make sense? So that's one encouragement that I'd give for that question is because it is the most common you're going to have hit you is how's the market. It's, it's a way for people to spark a conversation and they'll, they'll feel very different if you ask them a question in return, um, which is just, well, it depends. Are you more interested in buying, selling, or investing? Because each of them are a little bit different. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. So that's one, one example. Again, does that sound scripty? No, but I think everything you do in life is script. You start off faking it. Oh, yeah. And then eventually, yes, because like even an audiologist, he does the same thing every yes. single day. Appointment after appointment after I mean, appointment. Do you have some of the same go-to jokes? Oh, yes. We all do, right? <laughs> That's how it is. So look at it as the same in sales. I, I think a great way to phrase it was how you phrase it. It's just like their answers, right? Well, so, that was Clay. I stole from him. So yeah. yeah. I had never heard that before. Yeah. And that's where coming to Ignite is super helpful because you'll hear all of their top answers and just jot those down, right? Ooh, oh, that's a good conversation. This one right here with glasses. I mean, Colby. This is Colby. Yeah, Colby, Colby Kerr. What? Kerr, K-E-R-R. -R. Yeah, he's he's an awesome agent. Do you think you do that? Like, let's say that conversation happens. You're at the mall or someplace that you're like, we're not going to sit and have this whole conversation. And you're just kind of doing that for is that where you say, like, where would you take that? Like, hey, do you want me to give you a call? Do you want me to, like, how do you yeah. transition that so that there's actually some actionable thing without being, like, yes. so eager? Do you know what I mean? So, like, how do you yeah. So, uh, I'll use that initial analogy that I gave you all. If we go to McDonald's, how, many, how often are they asking you if you want an appetizer? Never. They just give you the main course, right? right, right there on the spot. Now, if you go to Ruth's Chris, right, what happens when you first sit down? They ask if you want anything to drink or any appetizers to start. Yeah, right? So what I would say is in those moments, even if it's on a phone call, you want to treat it like giving them an appetizer. You do not want to shove a meal down their throat at that time. Okay? So that approach of just giving them a very simple and knowledgeable answer, right, might look like, well, Lucas, it really depends. Are you more curious about buying, selling, or investing? Because each of those markets is a little bit different. Yeah, I want to invest. Awesome, awesome. What's kind of sparked your interest in investing? Or do you already have rental properties? Uh, I just saw the benefits of doing it, so I wanted to start. Okay, awesome. Yeah, the investment market's interesting. You know, things have shifted the last couple of years, especially with higher interest rates. So there's definitely a good way and a bad way to invest in this market. And most people are finding challenges to find cash flowing properties. Uh, that's something that we specialize in. I don't want to go and bore you with all the details right now, but I'm happy to set up a time for us to connect. Um, do you have 30 minutes either on Wednesday or Friday? That's when I have some availability. Uh, we can even look towards this weekend if that's better for you. Oh yeah, Friday works. Okay, great. Yeah, we can dive. So that's how I transition it to an appointment, right? Yeah, and like practice on your friends. Like call your, call your girlfriend or your mom or your whoever and say hey look let me do a cma for you I, and, and it could turn into a sale i mean it really could i mean you show up at somebody's house and you tell them that their house is worth a hundred thousand more than what they think it's worth they may start thinking about selling and so do it with people you're comfortable with first and that way if you make a mistake you don't crucify yourself yeah, and think about it for 10 years oh i will <laughs> no but yeah if you uh, ever have the chance to learn from Jake, Jake Bowers, he was one, uh, when I was the PC coach, he had just launched his career and um, he was working for Allison Lane Furniture Company here in Utah, higher end furniture. And um, he wanted to make the transition fully into real estate, but he was making well over six figures. So he's like, kind of like, I want to make sure that I make the same income before making the transition. Uh, he, he ended up selling 22 homes his first year like knocked it out of the park. Um, he's been consistently 25 to 30 units um, since, since that timeline. 
in 2021. And uh, one of his first deals, because in an Ignite session, the challenge was to call and practice on friends and family members. And he called a friend and said, hey guys, I'm, I'm making this transition. I'm so excited about it. I just need some friends to, and this is a closer friend. So he's like, I just need some people to practice with me. Are you cool if I come and practice my presentation with you? Yeah. And they said yes, and it turned into a, a buyer. Yeah, so, my, my, uh, my best friend since I was 17 has a 20 something, 24 year old son that I've known his whole life. And I did that and he was like, I am wanting to buy a condo this year to move into it. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And so that's going to be one of my first sales in Salem. And, and it's, it, you know, it's not like a pressure thing. Yeah. And that's where you can even start, you know, hey, no pressure here. I just want to kind of practice. I might fumble through this a little bit. Hope it's okay with you. They're going to be totally fine with it. Um, but then it might pique their interest, which is cool. Well, what I did was I said, I said, hey, yes. do you want to go look at some places with me? I'll buy you lunch. We'll go just drive around for a couple hours. It'll give me some practice. I'm not trying to sell you anything. And he was like, I want, I want to buy a condo this year. And I was like, all right, let's do it. Sweet. Six core competencies of a business. So uh, there are, there's actually 192 tasks of a mega agent. It's in the MREA. It's an actual list, uh, which is, there's legit 192 things that you could do to get a piece of business to the finish line. There's only six that actually are high income, okay? Meaning if you look at it this way, how many of you have a task list? Okay. So it, what if you had a payment scale on your task list You can choose tasks that were worth $10, some worth 50, 25, or 100. Which ones would you want to do the most? 100. When we draw it out this way, it's very simple, right? What you'll find is the challenge for most people's business is that they get stuck doing these tasks most frequently. Either because they're hesitant to make calls and to lead generate and do those things, that trigger all of the rest of these things. So lead generate, lead generation actually is the gatekeeper to all these other activities. Like you can't write an offer if you don't lead generate. Okay. So what you need to first do is have, I would recommend two different lists that you work from each week, your, your to do list, and then your success list. Your success list are those higher income producing activities. That's where you say, this is actually going to generate income for me in the future. Your to-do list might need to get done. It might be items that have to be done to get somebody through the finish line, but they're not going to generate income for you. And you just have to have that in the back of your head when you're working throughout your week. Am I, am I getting stuck here with these lower income producing activities or am I spending a good chunk of my time in these higher producing activities? Okay. And you want to time block that on your calendar. So I'd recommend in the morning is where you put your money-making hours because life is going to happen. Kids get sick and you need to pick them up from school or you get a flat tire or whatever happens, right? And so if you try to put your money list in the afternoon or the evening, rarely is it going to get done, okay? Or if you're dual career and you are going to have your evenings as part of your launch plan for starting your business, we'll just say, well, that first hour of getting into practice, I'm going to focus on the success list. And then the second hour is when I will get into the to-do list items. Okay. Like creating my email signature, putting together my business card, designing my website, ordering signs, ordering signs. like all these things where it's like, I, I, I do need signs. Well, if you don't have a listing, you don't need the sign yet. it'd be these things, all six of these would be the higher income producing activities. So uh, lead generating, capturing and converting to appointments. Number one, presenting to buyers and sellers to get agreements. So that's your actual appointment times. So the focus is um, with your goal for the year, you wanna break that into how many appointments do I need to go on? And that's the only metric you then focus on is, well, I need three appointments per month. Well, that's roughly one a week, right? So you can just say, did I do my appointment this week? Yes or no? 
black or white, very easy, right? And so uh, that's number two, showing buyers and sellers, um, showing buyers, so showing homes, so taking them to go out and actually look at homes, and then marketing listings that you have, writing and negotiating, negotiating contracts, coordinating the sell to closing, and then managing the money of the business. Those are the highest income producing activities in real estate. So where do your commission dollars go? So this is one of those tricks because what we there's this idea that people can end up with much more month at the end of their money. And we don't want to have, have that happen for you. Okay. Meaning that you want to properly account for a dollar in the door does not mean a dollar in your pocket. Okay. And so breaking down how this looks. When you're the listing agent, you've got the other agent typically that you're paying a compensation to. Okay? Um, how it traditionally works is you're taking the listing and you're telling the sellers how much you're going to sell the home for. And you're saying as a marketing strategy, I am going to put a buyer's agent commission on the MLS. And we're going to talk about that together, right? Whatever 2%, 3% that you're going to offer. Pretty typical is 3%. You're seeing a lot of two and a halfs right now as well. But you can say, and, and this is also valuable to explain in your listing presentation. When a client says, well, why am I giving you 6%? They have to know it's not actually going all in your pocket, right? So you've got, I know this is a little hard to see. It's kind of breaking it down and showing you. You've got a portion that goes to the other agent. You've got a portion that goes to the market center in the form of a split. You've got business expenses. You've got taxes. You've got your, and then you've got your net take home at the end. So taking all those things into account, you might end up with 50% of the actual income that comes in the door for you, right? So um, making sure that you're accounting for that, especially when you look at taxes, business expenses, things like that. So here's a diagram to kind of illustrate this is uh, on the left-hand side, somebody might sell a property and get a $9,000 commission check, it's Jessica. So Jessica ends up having 9,000 come into the market center. She has her normal split and she ends up with $5,760. So that 5,700 uh, $5, ends up in her bank account, her personal bank account. And then she thinks she has $5,700 to go spend. All right. Especially when tax season comes around, right? Because one thing that's not being accounted for here is business savings and tax savings. So uh, you, in the MRA goes through this, you want to have about 10 to 12% of your income going towards marketing. So to generate more business, it's an investment into more deals, right? How many of you would pay $1,000 to get 10,000? Yeah, easy math, right? Well, most agents shortcut themselves and say, I'm not going to do any marketing. I'm not paying for flyers. I'm not paying for mailers. I'm not paying for client events to bring people to Keller Splash or whatever. The challenge is it will actually slow your growth. You want to use some marketing dollars. Well, that takes you having some, dis uh, some um, discipline and putting money aside for future market, right? So this is how it should look. So you got a 9,000 commission check come in. You have that same $5,700 into the bank account. Now, what Jessica does is she actually transfers uh, 1,700 into her business bank account, okay? So she's paying herself first, her, her future business, essentially. And she knows a portion of that is coming in, in, just for clarity, all the money is going into the business account. Okay. Here, it was a personal account. You wanna take advantage of different tax benefits as a real estate agent, as a 1099 contractor. You wanna make sure that it's, the money's flowing the right way. So you want to have it come through an LLC into a business account. Does that make sense? So she's changed where the money goes. It's going into a business account. She's leaving $1,700 in that account. Then she's putting $4,000 into her personal account. Now, some of that's for spending, right? My normal, ordinary costs. Got to pay my mortgage, got to pay my car bill, my phone bill, all those things. But she left some money in her business to start marketing, right? From her personal account, she's having some of it go into a tax savings account. So she's setting money aside 
and knowing that, well, when you're 1099, we don't take taxes out. That's on you, right? Now, the nice thing is you get to actually structure taxes in a way where you keep more in your pocket at the end of the year. But you also have to plan for paying roughly 20 to 30% in taxes. So it's not fun to go make great money and then say, oh, I forgot to put money aside for taxes and the tax bill comes due, right? So Jessica then realizes, well, I've got 2,400 to spend that paying into my tax account. And that is broken into self-employment tax and then your federal and state taxes. Okay? So that's the better money flow with running a business. Okay? Any questions on that? Um, Gary Keller has this saying that money is good for the good that it can do. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of, we had a wealth summit a couple of weeks ago and talked about how there's a lot of negative money beliefs that are out there. Um, and many of you have had the same programming. Finish this sentence for me. Money doesn't grow. Oh, interesting. We all, we all know it. Money is the root of all. Huh. We all have the same programming. Interesting, right? And so uh, there's also positive programming. If your belief is money is good for the good it can do or that money doesn't change a person, it just amplifies what's there. So if you're a good person and you have more money, you can usually do more good, right? So you just want to be aware of what are my money beliefs because those also, uh, they're kind of like a thermostat. If you are <clears throat> consistently making a certain amount of money for many years, usually it's because your thermostat is programmed to that amount of money. And so if we come in this room, even though it's, I don't know, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, whatever it is outside, why is it not 40 degrees in this room? Thermostat. Thermostat kicks in and regulates this room, right? And same thing if it's super hot outside. If it's 100 degrees outside, it will still be fairly cool in this room. Your financial uh, 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 standing is the exact same. Whatever you've programmed that thermostat to, it's going to self-regulate back to that number until you reprogram it, okay? so. You can do that through positive and beliefs, positive empowering beliefs, and then also raising your why. Why do you need that additional money? Why do you need to make an extra 50 grand or 100 grand? Those reasons help you to raise that thermostat. So the flow of money. So income is what goes in, expenses is what goes out, and then your profit is what's left. So you wanna make sure that you have a P&L, a profit and loss statement for your business. You want to treat it like a business from day one. So even if you only sell one transaction, you want to ask yourself, what is the P&L or the profit and loss for my business this month? Okay. And your profit, you, there's a way to reverse engineer the goal. So you do this by starting with, what is my profit goal? So anybody want to throw out their goal for the year? Hundred, okay. So hundred thousand is the net profit goal. It means we have to earn more than that because we're going to have expenses come into play. So what we can do is say, well, how can I minimize expenses to maximize net income? So we want to be, we call it uh, playing the red light green light game. So every month you're going to look at your expenses for your business and say, is this actually Am I getting my ROI, my return on investment for this marketing dollars or for this whatever expense it is, right? If not, cut it or put it on pause. If it is working and it's providing more opportunity or providing a better experience as you run your business, right, leverage, then it might be something you keep, you green light. And then what happens is though your profit, your goal actually tells you what you're, you need uh, income wise, top line. So the profit margin for a business is usually about 40%. When you're starting out and you're solo, you have far less expenses. You usually, you, uh, part of that 60% expenses for a big business for what most of these agents are running is usually their employees, right? Like having other people on your payroll is usually the highest expense. And so when you're starting out, you usually don't have that. You're able to use the market center or our services and just pay $350 at a closing, right? So you're talking, you know, it might be less than 1% in costs on that. So let's just run with this though and meet in the middle. And let's just say that it's probably going to be about 30% is going towards uh, expenses to run your business. So let's reverse engineer this math. So if we want 100,000, 
what we're going to do <clears throat> is divide this by 0 0.3 is, excuse me, 0.7. So 142,857 is actually my top line revenue that I need to generate. That's really what I need to earn. Knowing that expenses are going to come, right? And with that, what I'm going to do as well is say, um, if the average commission for a home, let's just say it's 8,000 after splits and costs, right? Well, 147 divided by 8,000 would tell me that I need to sell 18 homes this year. Does that make sense? So it gives you a very clear target now by just reverse engineering the number. So it's very uh, actionable and purposeful. Rather than I just need to make 100 grand, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. Let's get clear about the number, right? Um, one that I, honestly we probably should have added in here. You should probably do it like divide by 0.5 to account for taxes as well, right? So just put that on top as well. So that that number might be closer to like 170,000 to truly net 100K after paying taxes and after paying expenses to run your business. Does that make sense? Any questions on some of those things we've gone through? Okay. So this is a further breakdown on how expenses work. There's two types of expenses. There's cost of sale, and then there's operating expenses. So a cost of sale only happens if you close a transaction. An expense, you have to pay regardless, right? For example, your MLS fees, do they say, hey, you can wait till you sell your first home and then you can pay us? No. They say, no, money's due today, <laughs> right? And you got to pay it every month regardless if you're closing business or not. Your board dues to be associated with the board, you have to pay those regardless if you're closing business or not. So expenses are those things that are ongoing, your rent, your your car, your phone bill, you have to pay those regardless. Cost of sale is going to be split with the brokerage. That's going to be your transaction fee, right? That's going to be your cost, your, your client gift that you buy after they close on a home. You only pay those things if you close the transaction. Does that make sense? So uh, typically in the MRA, it's 30-30. It's You're going to have 30% cost of sale, 30% expenses. So that first number that I was sharing with you where most of these agents play is they're looking for 40% net profit to run their business. But what they're doing is they're not wearing every hat. They're not the marketer. They're not the transaction coordinator. But up front, you usually have to start by doing all those things. But over time, you shift that and bring in leverage, so you make more dollar per hour. Does that make sense? So from all that we've talked about today, we've gone through quite a bit. Um, just a little recap. We've talked about gaining clarity on your big why and the plans for your future. We've talked about setting your personal and business uh, bu budgets. So again, you want to start with roughly a 50% number, knowing you're paying for taxes, you're paying for expenses during your business. And then as you grow that, you're going to bring people on to support you to grow your business. Um, we didn't go through this one too much in detail, but kind of mentioned you want to set up a business bank account tied to your LLC. Um, and talk to your CPA on that. Usually the guidance I've heard is they say once you're like 35-ish thousand in income for the year, is when you definitely want to have an LLC open. If you're like, I'm just going to sell one home, like that's my plan, then you can, you can potentially not go that route um, to take advantage of all the tax benefits that do come with having an LLC. And usually they will tax it as an S corp. So you have an LLC for the protection, the lim limited liability, but it will be taxed as an S corp. That's where all the tax benefits come from. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? So say if it's 30K, Ask your CPA. <laughs> they, yeah, so it, it, depends on what your says. it depends on what your CPA says. My first, I opened mine in 2014, and they did it retroactively. So, um, but I would still ask your CPA and make sure that they can do that. So I opened it probably in like October of that year, but they backed it to January 1. So all the income I made that year still applied. Yeah. 
Hey, so I got an off-related question. I'm sorry, but uh, we were at that open house on Saturday, and this buyer asked me a very strange question, and I felt very uncomfortable. But he was basically, they were an older couple, and they were like, they saw a picture on the wall that was like an antique, and they were like, how old is this seller? And I was like, I don't have any idea. I was like, I don't. I'm a bad judge of character. I don't know. Like, are you allowed to answer a question like that as a realtor? Um, yes, and I probably would not answer it. So my answer was, I don't know. I'm a really bad judge of character, maybe slightly older than you. And then that made it even more uncomfortable because like, <laughs> how old do you think I am? I was like, oh, I, was like I don't know, 50? Yeah, Dude. and I would probably still give them like a ballpark range, but I wouldn't be like, oh, they're like 78, right? No, like I, I would I just, just was like, I don't have any idea. I don't know what the rules are on that. So I was like, this is weird question. Like, yeah, so you, you have to stay away from questions that would, um, that could potentially harm your client's ability to negotiate and get the, the most amount of money. Could be. I mean, if you tell them they're 99 years old, they're going to be like, oh, they're senile. Right. So that's where you've got to take it into context, right? So you've got to be the one that holds that information and say, well, if I, based off of my client's situation, would this actually, could it harm our uh, potential to negotiate with this if they're a buyer or seller? And that's why my answer was just like slightly older than you. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. And flip side, you weren't listening to it, right? I wasn't. So it doesn't matter. You don't represent that client. Okay. So that's where as well, like if that was your potential buyer, you could find that information out and tell them that's not a problem at all. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that confusing or is that clear? Well, they, if they were his clients, right. yeah. So the seller was not his client. Yeah. So it doesn't, it, he's not the fiduciary in that deal. On the other side of that is the other people asking could have been his potential clients, right? There, if I don't know yeah. if they were represented or not, or um, they they claimed they were, but they yeah. almost looked like they were just like looking at like like a husband and wife on gotcha. a Saturday, you know, just their browsing. neighborhood. Let's go bounce over to that. Yeah, yeah. You know. So that's where I'm saying if if he's going to represent them, he wants to do that digging. He wants to find out all that information that would better position them in negotiation. No. Yeah, because I you have, you haven't signed anything saying that I'm going to protect you and your no. interests. Your fiduciary duty is to your client. So if you're on the buyer side, it's your best interest to find out as much information about the seller as possible to support that client in negotiations. But now, to be honest, it's not usually a question that we're going to ask. Like, I'm not going to call a listing agent. So tell me how old your clients are. Right? It's just not. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was but really I, weird. It was like this. And I asked the seller when she came back, because I was like, how old is that picture? Because I saw it, but it was like 120 years old. And it was this oval picture of a baby. And like it was bumped out. I don't know. I've never seen a picture. Yeah. Interesting. You'll have all sorts of weird stuff happen okay. in this industry. So we'll end with this quote um, from Gary Keller, so think and act the wage you want before you earn it. Okay. Average is as average does, good is as good does, and great is as great does. So what you do is who you become. So uh, Jim Rohn, he has a very similar way of thinking about this. He's passed on now, but was a phenomenal um, mentor, coach, public speaker. Uh, he's one of the individuals that coached and mentored Tony Robbins. And one of the things that he would say is he would say, uh, earn a million dollars, not for the, the money. Don't set a goal. For, and, and you can put whatever your financial goal is, 100 grand, 150, whatever the number is. So put that as a target, not for the money, but who it will force you to become in the process. So simply think that a new level of income just requires you to develop more value, more skill sets. You have to become a different version of you in order to earn that amount. So same thing in real estate is start thinking about being a top producer now. Start saying, well, what would a top producer's morning routine look like? How would a top producer handle this question that a client asks? How's the market? Will they just give them a quick answer or might they turn it into a conversation piece, right? 
So start thinking, well, what would a top producer do in this moment? And start acting like that before you're there. And eventually you'll become so. Okay. Sweet. Well, let's go through, take two minutes and just either in your notes or on your phone, text to yourself two things. One, what's your top takeaway from today? Because we've covered a lot of ground. What's the one thing that really was impressing upon you or stood out to you? And number two, what's the one action you are going to take in the next seven days? Um, you, for those who have been here, you'll know I often say that education without implementation is a form of entertainment. And here at KW, that's not what we're about. We want you to take action and get results. So ask yourself, what am I going to take action on in the next seven days that's going to help me move forward or progress my business? So just take a minute and a half, write those two things down, and then we'll share those with their group in a second. All right, we'll just kind of start in the same order and just zigzag. So, top Sorry, takeaway. Me? Yep. Um, I put down the core four and the value proposition. Hmm. Probably the two that I came up with. Awesome. What about the value proposition? Is just understanding where your strengths and weaknesses are and being able to present that to clients is probably something that I need to get more on. Yeah. That's great. Awesome. And the action item? The action item is to work on my case studies because I haven't done those yeah. yet. Yeah. Cool. I put learning the market completely. So learning buyer's market, seller's market, and investor's market. Just so it can be a better talking point. It's, it, it's kind of the make or break if you don't know what it is. It's kind of just don't get knowledgeable. Um, and then I said I can implement more in the conversation and start reaching out to people via socials. Sweet. Right. Um, I was thinking about the six core competencies. I'm sitting there thinking, oh man, that would be really easy for me to sit and like dick around and make a business card for a long time. Uh -huh. But I like the way you have that drawn out. Well, you can put ten dollars on this. You can put ten dollars on this. You can put a dollar on this. You really need to put those numbers on for some reason at the moment. Um, not to lose sight of who we are. Totally. But um, in the next seven days, I want to finish this, you know, regular real estate course. But also, I'm going to call on some people. See? With someone else, how the market's doing? I want to do better than what I just did. <laughs> no, so that is, that's going to be like just a little practice. And just know, like when we, because you're going to have other instructors ask you to talk and stuff. We want you to practice in this environment. We want you to fill it here, yeah. rather than filling it when a client asks you and you're like, oh, oh, right. So it's good and it's it's natural, normal. So my top takeaway was learn to create conversations that provide value and provide an invitation for the person to take. Mm. And my action this week is I'm going to pass my exam on Friday. Sweet. Oh, cool. Taking it. No, you will. You're taking it to uh, EDU. No, it's like Draper. Draper. Center and something. Draper yeah. Center. Cool. I did it at EDU. They didn't have it on Friday. So, uh, so I have. 
Let me slap my butt like that. I, 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 um, I really like, so, HTML is something that I've been trying to figure out because I want to start working on that or part of it in the LLC. Yeah. Also, uh, I like the, the way you answered, um, how was the market today? When you said, well, it depends. Like, are you a buyer, seller, or investor? And so that changed the, like, shows more value for me when someone asks me that. And so I look, so when you see what, like, I know what I'm doing. And so changing those methods of how I respond to that, like, I really like that, how you said that thing. Mm. And uh, same thing, like, that's why, um, just like, it's like a bank where you're like, you deposit, you deposit, then you withdraw. Yeah. I like that, like, mindset as well. And so I want to bring that into my day to day, like, methods when I'm talking to people, include that into it where I'm asking them what is their interest in it. Like, a lot of people want to know about the market, is there currently wanting to invest, buy, or sell? And so that's going to help me build more relationship with people. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Um, I want to really focus on, or well, what I spoke about was knowing your big why and your mission. Like, I got first thing that they would have to do. Like, that's what I worked on in the past. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sweet. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming today's session. Um, is I kind of pointed out at the beginning, this is the end of Ignite, uh, but I would say go back through, especially for those of you obviously who are just starting. Um, at the very uh, um, at the at our desk, we have a printout of all the classes, and so typically Ignite's Monday, Wednesday, Friday from nine thirty to eleven thirty, and so you can be in here with a top producer every every you know three times a week um, and be able to learn best practices. Uh, I will just tell you two stories to finish up um, or two different, you know, stories of two different people. Uh, Jake Bowers actually is, is the, on the left-hand side, uh, the story that I would encourage you to be in that same boat is do what, what Jake did. And then, and it's, it's kind of the idea of, of the different levels of commitment people have coming into this industry. You have people who are curious about real estate where it's like they're, they would like this to turn out and evolve into something cool, right? That could be some great income in it. And then there's people who are uh, uh, committed, where they're saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make this work. And the difference is you'll have the people who are curious, they'll dabble when it comes to Ignite. They'll be like, oh, I'm going to pop into the sessions where I like the title because it sounds appealing. And or I'm going to just go through it once so I can check it off the box and say that I, I learned, right, that I went through the course. The Jake went through, he said, I'm going to go through Ignite once every quarter. And that's what I would encourage. If you want to become a master, it's through repetition. So there's a lot of stuff that you guys probably heard me say today that you're not going to remember next week. You can only retain 20-ish, 30% of the stuff. But when you go through it three times, every time you're going to pick up new stuff. And so it compounds on your learning. And so that's where I'd encourage you is set a, an intention, say, first year, I'm going to be a sponge. And I'm going to go through multiple times because that's where you're going to get the highest return on your investment. What I'll promise is you're only going to see, Lucas, there's other people who've gone through Ignite with you. You're the only ones going back through it for a third time. Okay, so that's what usually happens. So, which is totally fine. Everybody's on their own journey, but that would be my encouragement if I was starting all over again is I would be obsessed and committed to learning as much as I could. But outside of these Ignite times, just know as well, some people can use this as a, an excuse to not lead generate. So also don't be in that boat. So if you go to Ignite, you have to put lead generation in the afternoon and say, I'm going to commit to that hour or two hours of lead generation. I'm not going to skip it just because I had Ignite in the morning. Does that make sense? So uh, that's my encouragement is, is be committed, be obsessed with this, and things will turn out the way they're supposed to. Cool? Okay. Any other questions as we wrap up? Great. If you can be here tomorrow, 11 a.m., we'll have a great session. So thanks. Yeah, thank you.